Buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, the very first thing that I want to show you so that you might have an idea why do I keep pushing this subject. For, first of all, it's always been my interest to learn Bible prophecy. This goes back to 1993, eight years before I was saved, when I was very much unsaved and very much... Um, an unbeliever. I was very much against the idea of a church in the Bible. And I was in Minneapolis. Being a small town white boy, I was in the big city. And I happened by chance to uh, run into a, a gentleman that was um, covered in boils. Told me he had been pronounced or had uh, actually been... Uh, uh, dead, flatlined three times. Uh, first time was by electrocution, and then two other times by surgery. All right, so I'm sitting next to this guy. He's a big boy, and he's got boils up and down his arms and on his face and on his neck. I'd never seen anybody like him before. And I'm sitting right next to him in a in a you know one seat truck. And we're giving him a ride, me and the buddy I worked with. We're giving him a ride, and, and he tells me that if I don't believe in the Bible, now is the time because Bible prophecies are being fulfilled. Now, me being an unbeliever had no idea what that meant. I mean, I had no idea what the Bible said. I couldn't argue against what he said because, you know, if I'm being honest with myself, I, at the time, I did not know what the Bible said. So I can't say the Bible is wrong on, in, an, in an honest way. I can't say that. I can argue against the idea of God and church and all that but I can't argue against what the Bible actually says because I don't know what it says so a couple years later I get my hands on a Bible and I start reading a little bit and it, it drastically it had a big effect on me okay so then uh, finally in 2001 <laughs> I I couldn't resist it anymore right I knew the Bible was true. And really all I needed, all it took for me was John chapter 3. Alright, so where I began reading to disprove the Bible was in the book of John, recommended by a friend of mine. By the time I got to the third, church, uh, third chapter, I was like, wow. When Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is is spirit that that hit hard I mean that cut right into my soul and being stubborn as I am it still took a while for me to realize hey this thing this is the Bible's true all right and then of course um, you know uh, starting really in 2001, I just, I, I, you know, I'm 31 years old, and I'm far behind. I'm way behind all these experts and scholars and these people that went to church their entire life. So I had a lot of catching up to do. So I was spending 12 hours a day reading the Bible. I wanted to know. I wanted to know the truth. It was, you know... <laughs> When you find the truth, it's the, the it's greater than finding a treasure full of gold. And so I, I just dug into it, and and here we are, 23 years later. But starting, really, I could trace it back to, you know, when I was, you know, a child wanting to know what the future is right and then of course I find this thing that is greater than a treasure of gold 
and it tells me the future. And so I've taken a particular interest in Bible prophecy. And Bible prophecy is very, very clear all throughout the Bible. It really, it's teaching the same thing from Genesis to Revelation, and it's all very simple. It's worded differently, but it says, it always says the same thing. It's always consistent. There is no contradiction, no conflict, and um, it's really given us the same image from a different perspective. It's like uh, 360 degrees of the same image. And then once you understand it, then it becomes clear, comes easy, simple to see. Right? And, and I've talked about this over and over and over and over and over and over. This world is coming to an end, and there is a world of everlasting life to come. This world comes to an end when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. See, this world was destroyed by water, and now it is reserved unto fire. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up into the air, and our enemy, the unsaved, are at our feet. And the Lord stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. It's real simple. This is taught all throughout the Bible, over and over, and over and over, and over and over again, and again, and again, and again. All right, now, it's interesting, very interesting, because in the last days, there will be mockers and scoffers walking after their own lust. You know, when Jesus is asked, what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The very first thing he says is, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying that I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. Well, that's, you know what that means, right? That means there are a bunch of people today that say Jesus is the Christ. They call themselves Christian. They stand behind the pulpit, leaders of, of mega churches, and they are deceivers. They are liars. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, with more study, I realize, hey, these guys, they actually believe that they are a good person. So they are trusting in themselves and being phony when they say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. When actually they just believe in themselves. Of course, uh, Jesus goes into that uh, numerous times. So, anyways, that's why, to me, this is a, a very important, a very interesting subject. Is because the truth is so simple in the Bible... And yet, here in the world, we see so many people that are deceived. And these people, you have compassion for it, for them, I get it. I have compassion for them too. I want them to know the truth. The problem, they don't care about the truth. They want to present themselves before God and everybody that they are a good person. And God and you ought to know... They are not a good person. There is none that is good. There is only one that is good, and that is God. And that's why we, that's why, like for me, <laughs> I, I can't do it. I know it. I just can't do it myself. I have to have a Savior. I got no chance. I got no chance otherwise. I need somebody to save me. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? All right? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's my only chance. And you read about this over and over all throughout the Bible. 
For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Right? Because I can't do it myself. We get, God has given us everything to be able to do it ourselves, but we can't do it ourselves. And that's why the Lord provides a Savior. All right, so we are 100% at the mercy of God. That's why we read in Second, in uh, Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's by the grace of God that we're saved. It's not by our works. Right? Okay, so anyways. So I just want to show you here in Revelation 20, it's not just a couple of people. Right? When I say 99.9% .9 of all the preachers in the world today, or in particular in YouTube, it's a reflection of the world, 99.9% .9 is a generous percentage. It's more than that. Look, it's if you go through here and you'll see every one of these every single video in the last 24 hours is from a person a preacher that does not believe the Bible all right so if you have a Bible and you believe it you know that there is no mention of a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ it's not anywhere it's not in Revelation 20 it's not found anywhere at all and the Bible is crystal clear it's overwhelming when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of this world I don't know how people miss it well I, I, I do know how people miss it because they don't believe what the Bible says and it <laughs> again it's all throughout the Bible that tells us that there will be people like that in the last day all right for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order Christ the first fruit afterward they that are Christ at his coming and that's the end when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of this world right so there's the resurrection of the dead that happens at the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is judgment day the great and terrible day of the Lord all right this is evident all throughout the Bible when Jesus comes he will come as a thief in the night and when he comes the heavens and the earth shall pass away that's when he comes in the clouds of heaven see that's when God sends fire down upon the earth that's when God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying evil forever it's a big deal all right and this is all throughout the Bible I mean you can't get around it you can lie to yourself you can lie to others you can fool yourself you can fool others but it will never change the truth of God all right so when Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. And then here we got all these people saying, no, oh, no, all things continue as they are from the beginning. It's interesting to me. I just find it so interesting. And I wonder if I'm the only one. It don't matter if I am the only one. But I just wonder if I am the only one. I, I do. It's interesting because here in Second Peter chapter 3, it says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. We see this exactly happening and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And so these preachers, one after another, they preach this idea of not only a bonus thousand years, right? Not only a bonus thousand years, but a a thousand years of peace and perfection right now I got to show you something here and I mean I've and of course and if they figured out there is uh, there's not <laughs> it, it just doesn't make any sense 
All right, so, all right, a thousand years of peace and perfection, and then God's going to come and send fire and destroy everybody. That doesn't make any sense. What, a thousand, Jesus reigns a thousand years, and then what, you take over? Jesus reigns forever. There is no mention of Jesus reigning a thousand years. It's not in Revelation 20. It's not found anywhere at all in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is very clear. Jesus reigns forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. All right, so... At the end of the thousand years is when the world is destroyed. The world comes to an end. Right? And right here in verse 9, fire come down from God out of heaven and devour them. That's the end of the world. That's not a second end of the world. It's not a third end of the world. It's not a fourth end of the world. It's the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's This is consistent all throughout the Bible. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. You see right here, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Second Peter chapter 3. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment, perdition of ungodly men. This is There's not two ends of the world. You can't have two ends of the world. It's a, illogical. It, and so you have to, you know, I, I don't know, is it, is it low IQ or is it just a reluctance to believe the written word of God? I, that's what I think. That's my very strong opinion that these people full on reject the word of God. Full on reject it. They don't care about the truth at all. If they cared... Why would they be preaching this? Because there's no logic to this idea whatsoever. None. You can't be using your brain cells and read this where fire comes down from God and then read this in Second Peter chapter 3, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire. You know full well that God destroyed this world by water in the days of Noah. Then so also should you know that God's going to destroy this world by fire when he comes in the clouds of heaven. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's fire. You can't figure that out. Well, that's on you. If you just don't have the brain cells to think. That's just, as my mom used to say, tough titty kitty. You know, I, I recommend that you figure it out. Right? The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You don't have an excuse on this. Nobody does. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven... He will destroy this world by fire. Now, he's promised, and he will gather us together with him in the clouds. All right, and then will he destroy this world? All right, so we don't have to worry about nothing. We got nothing at all to worry about. First Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All right, so uh, that's important, man. It's important. Now, you have to... Be very, very low IQ to read this and to think, oh, well, the unsaved, they'll be all right. We're all going to be gathered up into the air, but the unsaved, they'll be okay. Yeah, he'd be all right. No. There's a reason why we are gathered up into the air. That's because hell is coming upon the earth. Unlike anything that's ever happened in the history of the world. Worse devastation, arguably, 
than the flood of Noah's time. The earth and the heavens will pass away. The elements shall melt with fervent heat and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You got no chance, man. You got no chance. If you're not up in the air with the Lord, you got no chance. So, if you understand that, and then you still say that there's a thousand years coming, you have to concede the fact that there are only saved people after this moment when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right? And then you have to, in a very low IQ sort of way, make the argument that there's going to be a second end of the world and that God is going to send fire down from heaven and devour saved people. That's all you're left with. There's nothing else. All right? Now, I want to address this idea that uh, uh, there will continue to be sex. Because the, this is what the whole, everybody, all these guys, the thousand-year reign of Christ, it's all based on sex. It's, that's the root of this, this teaching. And it's exactly what we read in Jude and also in Second Peter chapter 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now let me do a word search for you. Alright, we're going to search lust and sin. Okay, Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your body that ye, show, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Let not sin therefore reign in your body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now think about that. Now, if you're one of these low IQ people, forget about it. Okay. Let's go back to sleep. All right. If you are born of God, think about this. Let not sin therefore reign in your body, in your mortal body. All right. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. Just relax. It's okay. Think about it. All right. Now, this verse that you should obey it, that you should obey it. So this body, this mortal body, has this desire. Just as you have feeling and senses, where you, you, you feel happy, you feel sorrow, you feel pain, you cry, you rejoice, you jump for joy, and all this sort of stuff, so also is it natural that your body has lust. All right. Jesus also had those same feelings, but he never allowed it uh, to, um, not, you know, affect him. Right? He had the same feelings, but we're not as strong as he is. That's why we need him. To save us all of us none of us have a chance without him all right now let's go down to James chapter 1 verse 15 then when lust has conceived it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished brings forth death all right now consider this in the light of this idea of a thousand years of uh, perfection a perfect uh, period of time after Jesus comes where people are going to be having sex it, according to these uh, you know mindless robots if you want is that too harsh then when lust has conceived it brings forth sin all right so in this when Jesus comes he kind of stomp his foot on a head of the serpent destroying all evil forever so the reality is there will be no more sin all right in first corinthians 15 when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are changed in a moment and twinkling an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised 
incorruptible and we shall be changed. So when this happens, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, he's going to do away with sin forever. All right, now consider this in the light of James 1. Then lust, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. All right, this goes back to Genesis 3. You know that, right? Genesis 3, because Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because they did that, God put it on a woman to greatly multiply her sorrow in, and um, you know, her conception. In sorrow she shall bring forth children, and her desire shall be to her husband, and he shall rule over her. All right, because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because they did that, they're going to have children. And because in order for, you know, in order for that to be a thing, there has to be lust. And that's because there's lust, there's that desire to have children. All right. That's, you know, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. But it's still, regardless, it's part of this world that we're in right now. And that's going to be done away with at the end of the world. Okay? There's going to be no more loss. Jesus says, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the children of God. So they're not marrying. They're not having sex. They're not having children period in first John chapter 2 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world and the world passes away in the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever the lust will be done away with when the world is done away with Right? And the world is done away with when the Lord Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Uh, I know that's going to be, I mean, that's going to be so sad for so many people when they find this out. When, they, when it strikes them right between the eyes, the realization that they won't be having any more sex, it's going to it's going to hit them hard, or really hard. At first, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Revelation 1, it says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. They're going to wail because they're going to know they ain't going to be having sex no more. They're going to wail. In Matthew 24, uh, for example, it says, uh, All the tribes of the earth shall mourn. All the tribes of the earth will mourn when he comes in the clouds of heaven. Right? All the tribes of the earth mourn. They're going to be devastated when they find out that they're not going to be having sex any longer. It's going to hurt. Oh no, no more sex. In fact, it's going to affect some people so much that they're going to be having heart attacks. It's going to be bad. No more sex. Their hearts are going to fail them. They're going to be having heart attacks, man. They're going to know that when it's the end of the world, there ain't going to be no more sex. And boy, that's going to be devastating. Because all these people, that's what they're putting their hope into. All their faith, all their hope, all their dreams are in this idea of a thousand year period of sex. Carefree sex. That's what it's about. It can't be about anything else. There's no other reason to preach the idea of a thousand years after Jesus comes other than putting your hope your faith, your dreams into this idea of guilt-free sex. 
And I've even pointed out that people will say they will be in their glorified body so that it'll be like they're 16, 20 years old again. And they'll have the freedom to have sex with whoever they want. And they go the other way and say that, well, you don't have to get married to anybody. You just have sex with whoever. It's going to be great. Oh, boy, are they in for it. Uh, they really are. Yeah, yeah, they really are. And so this is the world that we're in right now. Where every single preacher, there's not one that gets us right. I, I don't If you find one that gets it right, show it to me. Not, I've looked at all these. None of them get it right. They all got it wrong. Now, they're not going to come out and say, hey, there's going to be a thousand years of sex. No, but they will come out and say that there will be children. As I showed yesterday or the day before, they claim that there, you'll have children and you won't have to worry about infant death. All right. That's a. That sounds great, man. It sounds great, doesn't it? Have all this guilt-free sex and don't worry about infant. Your baby's dying. Everything's good. No sin. Perfect government. You know, Donald Trump's going to be your president forever, or Joe Biden, or whoever it is that you you love and adore, and respect and worship. Well. You're in for a shocker. Alright, and so when the time comes, you're not going to have an excuse. None of these guys are going to have an excuse. And it, it, to me, it's just quite astonishing. <laughs> you know, every single one of these guys, they got it wrong. They don't care about the truth. Why would you listen to all these perverts? Why would you listen to any of them? Really? How about this? Believing the Bible that you hold in your hands. Believing that it comes directly from God above. I'm telling you, you're going to find out that in fact, it does. The King James Bible comes directly from God. 